Another event on the environment is making its debut. The Gen Zero Climate Summit brings together global leaders to discuss ways to reduce carbon more quickly. Now, it's held during Tomasic's Ecosperity Week with the theme, Navigating Climate Crossroads. And for more, Frederick Teo, CEO of Gen Zero, joins us. He leads the Tomasic launched platform firm. And of course, uh, as you just spelled out for me, this aims to accelerate uh, decarbonisation solutions globally. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Right. Uh, June marks Gen Zero's first anniversary. Uh, if you can, give us a right. fair scorecard on how the company has done in terms of driving climate action and providing these decarbonisation solutions. Right. So Gen Zero was established a year ago with a mission of accelerating decarbonisation solutions globally. We invest into three focus areas. Firstly, into nature solutions. Secondly, technology solutions. And finally, carbon ecosystem enablers or carbon market solutions. These three different pathways to accelerating decarbonisation is particularly important. And we think that we need to have this dynamic portfolio because there is no one silver bullet, no one, you know, key app in order to be able to achieve decarbonization. So in the past one year, we have deployed uh, about 500 million US dollars in new investments um, in various areas, such as, for example, bioplastics and sustainable aviation fuel, and also in the nature-based side uh, in a, a sustainable forestry company in the United States, as well as uh, providing cook stoves to rural communities here in Southeast Asia. So there isn't one silver bullet yes. to actually achieve all of this, as you just articulated there, but technology is being heavily leveraged on for yes. solutions. Yes. And, and at the summit, that's going to be featured uh, quite a bit. Yes. Tell us if how nature-based solutions like uh, restoring right. uh, ecosystems or avoiding emissions mm -hmm. actually stack up against the use of technology in this sphere. Right. So Don, in order to be able to answer that question, I think it's important to take one step back and ask ourselves as climate investors or investors in a decarb space, how do we actually think about a good investment? And I would suggest that there are probably about four or five important uh, criteria or factors to consider. The first is actually to ask ourselves, how much capital do you actually have to solve these problems? The second, what kind of time frame do you have to achieve the climate impact? Uh, and then third, uh, what is the quality of the impact that you want to achieve? Do you merely want to be able to avoid additional emissions or do you want to take emission, uh, carbon out of the atmosphere? Mm -hmm. right. Fourth, you also have to ask yourself, how much do you want to achieve uh, in terms of carbon impact? And finally, what kind of financial returns are you actually targeting? Now, within these five parameters, you construct an optimal portfolio to be able to achieve it. Technology solutions offer fundamental decarbonization pathways for our industries. Very important, right? Um, however, they could be very long in gestation. The technologies might not be mature. It might require a lot of investment in order to get climate impact only further down the line. However, if you are investing into nature solutions, it might be cheaper to do. It would be able to do it uh, in the near term, and you might be able to achieve a lot more climate impact. However, they tend to be offsetting rather than fundamentally decarbonizing our industries, and you might not be able to fully quantify the impact that you have created. So these are the different trade-offs that we need to consider, and depending on what you want to achieve, then you can toggle between technology and nature solutions. Take, for example, direct air capture. We talk a lot about it, but trees are also direct air capture machines. Yeah. So really, if you think about what you want to try and solve, uh, you can yes. actually think about uh, choosing a tech pathway or a nature-based pathway. See, this is reasonable and logical if you consider one person, one company, even one country. Right. Across countries, you talk about global solutions, right? What mm -hmm. one country does is never going to be good enough. Every country will have, as you say, different parameters, different priorities. How do you get them to agree on at least a base level so that we can move towards, I don't know, the one point, not breaking the 1.5 degrees Celsius barrier? I think you're absolutely right. So collaboration between countries are absolutely important when we're dealing with a topic like climate change because it's transnational in nature. So no one country can actually solve it on its own, however uh, you know, rich in resources you might have. So the idea here really is, depending on the natural attributes of a country, the resources that you have at your disposal, the land size, for example, then you will have to find different pathways to getting decarbonization going. Take, for example, Singapore. We are a very small country. So even though we are supposed to be a sunny island in the sea, 
The reality of it is that we have tropical thunderstorms and dark clouds almost every other day. So something like solar would work to an extent, but it will not be able to fully solve our problems. Moreover, we are a very small country and therefore we don't have the space for us to have enough solar panels to be able to power our, our industries and our economies. So really, depending on what we have as a start point, we would then need to be able to leverage on other uh, options and solutions, like for example, importing green energy uh, from overseas. One of the key economies that we see developing mm. over the next 10, 15 years is the green economy here in Singapore, but also regionally as well. I mean, there are countries that are some way ahead of others. Yes. Uh, efforts are not uh, sort of going at the same rate at all globally, if you, if you think about it. What kind of potential do we have here in Singapore, as small as we are, as you say, uh, to actually kind of be a change maker in, in this area? Well, sometimes being a small uh, country can also offer quite a few important advantages. You are more nimble in your regulation. You are able to be a lot more innovative and try. Don't forget, we actually solved our water problem through innovative solutions and investing into research and development so that today we are virtually self-sufficient in water. So there are certain advantages. But there are also other things that Singapore has built up over the years that will give it significant advantages when we're thinking about a green economy transition. Take for example, we have a, a world-class petrochemical hub, right? So if we are talking about the energy transition, with the kind of technical base that we already have here in Singapore, we are better able to transform our industries into something that will be better ready for the, clean, uh, the green economy. We are also co-located with an, a global aviation hub. So on something like sustainable aviation fuel, for example, we, are, we have the benefit of having a petrochemical hub co-located with a global aviation hub, which will make sustainable aviation fuel something that is quite natural for Singapore to take a leadership position on. So really, even as Singapore, notwithstanding some of the uh, you know, limitations and constraints, there are also massive opportunities. Well, we wish you all the very best with the summit opening tomorrow as well Great. for Gen Zero. Gen Thank Zero. you very much. Oh, thanks for that. Uh, Mr. Frederick, to the CEO of Gen Zero, thanks so much for coming in to join us this evening.